and I'm recording. <laughs> so it's setting it up and there we, and I guess we're now, um, hopefully we're now Facebook live. Uh, so, um, I'm going to say, let us know who you are if you uh, are watching. Okay. Um, so anyhow, so, so tell, so so tell is, me about Portugal. Okay. So yeah, I, um, so I, 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 last, last week I was in Portugal and the reason I went was that I was keynoting an ed tech conference called Super Tabby, uh, which was in Porto. And there were about 900 people there, and there was probably another 13 or 1400 people who were online. And um, as I said, it was it was ed tech. And what I was asked to speak about originally was augmented reality, virtual reality, and the metaverse, and how they you know they could be used in classrooms. And I told the people who were organizing, who were great, um, you know, I said, you know, I think that with all that's happening in schools. Um, why don't we just talk about like this big transition as school starting this year after two and a half really bad idea bad years and they said you know and uh, how teachers might be feeling and what they could you know um you know what they could look forward to so they thought that was that was a good idea and so i based the whole talk not on technology uh but on the fact that um you know we you know, these two years have have been rough in and of themselves and kids are coming back and they're a year, year and a half behind where they where they they were expected to be. And um, there's a lot of pressure to, like, catch them up. And so we should return back to the way schools worked before. That's at least that's how I started and then kind of transitioned and said, well, when, when you talk about schools worked before, there's a couple of thoughts. Um, one thought is that, um, you know, uh, you can never go back, you know, we're always moving forward. Time only goes one way. So you're not going to go back to exactly the way things were before, no matter what. And the other thing is that work, you know, like learning is the work that kids do in school. And so we don't want them playing. We want them working. Right. And then kind of transition from there that, you know, but when we think about when we do our best work, it's when we're enjoying it. And so um, isn't that the same with kids? And all mammals actually learn through play. And so it's not that work is the opposite of play or that play is the opposite of work. Play is the opposite of drudgery and boredom. And so we don't want school to be you know, drudgery and boredom. We want it to be play. But the kids can't be having fun unless the teachers are having fun. So that the the whole thing about being back in school this year is let's first of all concentrate on both teachers and students having fun and then worry about things after that. And um and and to acknowledge the fact that as soon as they start having fun, there's going to be people, whether they're administrators or parents or other teachers, um, who start saying, Well, wait a minute, you know, like why are kids having fun? Um, you know, they should be uh teaching, they should be learning. And so, you know, when kids are having fun and kids are having fun with technology, there's studies that indicate that that's preparing them for these types of professions. And these are the types of professions that we want them to have in the 21st century anyhow, that they're really preparing for. And so you can just say, look, I'm not having fun with the kids. I'm preparing them for these professions, which is what our, what our goals are. And then you can go back to having fun. Um, and so that was my talk. And it, it, I think it went over great. I was, you know, right. I enjoyed it. I think the people enjoyed it. We, we, you know, we, we joked. And then afterwards we had a Q and a session and we talked about, um, uh, you know, both fun and, uh, the opportunity we have in coming back and trying to rethink the way, uh, you know, the, the way we interact with kids and, uh, the reason why you all got into education is because we love seeing kids get really excited, um, yeah. and enjoying themselves. And there's my wife in the background. Yeah. So. Hello. So <laughs> what I like about what you did there, and I was kind of, we were having conversations as you were getting ready to go mm -hmm. uh, to Portugal, was the circuitous route you took um, in, in 
in broaching this entire subject and the fact that you kind of set it like volleyball, you set and then you spiked. So you set it up like you were going to be a hardcore, old school, double down, work harder, more rigor, all of that. And, you know, it's funny when audiences with you, sometimes they're like, yeah, we should, even if they don't quite. Right. Agree. Right. Yeah. Then, yeah. We got to work harder. And then. <laughs> And with yeah. the other hand, you kind of smacked him upside the head and said, get over it. Like, you know, on Sharon Moonstruck, guy, get over it. And Because <laughs> I believe the same as you believe. And I think that there's brain research to back up that idea yep. that, that the two places where we're most apt to invent or to be inventive is during dream, dream and during play. And, that you know, in dreams, crazy things happen. And, and you can look at that. You can really examine that. Like in a dream, your senses are turned off and therefore everything you know is turned in on itself. And you only have to play with the things you already have. So the things kinds that you of can combinations imagine. Of, right. Yeah. So it's all just the combinations of what can happen without the influence of a director of some kind or a you know a, a teacher or so. It's just your brain fending for itself and looking for, you know, and yeah, it's affected by emotions or what you felt that day or whatever. But I think when things become concrete, it's mm -hmm. when we're allowed to put them out like Lincoln logs and actually build, you know, the top of revised Bloom's taxonomy is, is create. Mm -hmm. So, you know, play and create. So I always say play is where ideas audition for a part in the brain's production of understanding. Hmm. That's probably the best thing I ever thought. So play, play, is, play where... is where ideas audition for a part in the brain's production of understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as if they all came to the play tryouts, um, these, these ideas, and if they're not given permission to do that, <laughs> they're never gonna be part of it. That's what right. Revised Blooms is saying. When a kid can create something from what they've learned from you, they actually own it. They have it, it's concrete. It, 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 and until then they're renting with an option to buy, but they don't own it. And that's all the things you forgot about school, all the things that you, you held on to until the quiz yeah. and then prom promptly forgot because it never became concrete. And so it's funny how, you know, to some people play is the opposite of what they think. See, to me, if you want to define rigor in a way that makes sense, rigor, I think is, is the effective, the effective act of learning, not just the, the act of learning, you know, but, but without measure without measuring whether it was effective or not right you know the stuff you remember was effective i don't care what they were doing yeah. or how the stuff you don't remember whatever pedagogy there was there didn't work it yep. didn't work and whenever people say well prove to me this thing you're going to do is going to work i always get mad and say prove to me what you're doing is working right 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 nobody ever proved that a book works right that's right. So, you know, it works for who it works for. It's okay. I think that the biggest thing is we need to loosen up a little bit. Yeah. At that idea of play, I bet that went over well. And that's a bigger audience than I thought you were going to have. You said 900? Yeah, with 900 were there. Yeah. Attending vir virtually. Mm -hmm. That's big, dude. That's big. I'm proud of you. That's not that. That's not oh, you know, that's not an easy day. So, but I know how you are. You're just going to go in there and kind of play with people and kind of do what you say, which is awesome. So, <laughs> I. Awesome. But just so Mark Gura actually had a really interesting comment as we were as we were just getting into this. The issue of fun versus studying goes back goes back long before COVID. It's far broader than soon the soon to be forgotten learning loss buzz that uh, yeah. that we're all hearing about. But I know you, you know, like you've been you've been advocating fun and learning, you know, for at least three months, right? Maybe even for <laughs> uh, you know. People like you and I, I think we, we, you could call us refugees from the system that we were looking for places where it could be fun back when we were doing it and being told. I remember being told by Miss Norwood to put the pencil in the correct hand. And she, as she pulled my pencil out of my left hand and put it in my right hand, I knew where I was and where I wasn't in a place where, <laughs> where fun happens in classrooms. Um, there was a, there was a script and I had to follow it. And so I was always looking for a place in public school, and remember, I went to school in 20 states, hmm. and the only places I found that were in music rooms and art rooms. Not, not, not always I'm saying you couldn't find it in math. It depended on the teacher. When you had a weird teacher who I could tell learned math in spite of the system and then hmm. became a different kind of conduit for the understanding of the love. How about love? The right. love of math first, the playful of, approach to understanding why numbers work. And there are kids, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a, 
there's a whole cartoon called Number Blocks. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, number Blocks. Everything great comes out of the UK, I think. Number Blocks. One, two, three, Number Blocks. And there's these little characters that look like, you know, Number Blocks that you use with kids for tactile mm -hmm. math, you know, right. learning. Uh -huh. They're so cute. But my kid watches that and eats it like candy because it, the approach to math is fun and full of all kinds of drama. And there's a bigger reward than just, you know, an A on a report card. It, it, there's a dopamine reward there in terms of entertainment. That, right. Why can't it be fun? Does it have to suck? I mean, does it, is that a definition of some kind? Well, if it yeah. sucks, the best we can expect is for the people, you know, with kids or adults, whoever's learning, or the teachers, for that matter, to just be compliant, right? They're just doing what they minimally have to do in order to meet um, some minimal standards. But if people are having fun, they put a, they're put all willing to put a lot more effort into it, right? You're right. It's funny how that compliant word, the first part of that compliant, complacent, have a lot of the same Correct. beginnings, you know? Uh, um, right. I was listening to, um, I was listening to my, my, you know, I, I like to read The Eye of the Vortex by Rodolfo Linus. He's one of my favorite neuro researchers. Mm. And he talks about uh, when he started studying sentience and how people became creatures that, that call themselves I. That's the whole idea of the eye of the vortex is that we see ourselves as from the outside. We can see ourselves objectively, which is kind of a huge Big, big deal. But he studied to understand from the very beginning and to move into more complex structures. He studied sea squirts. You know, who does that? He studies sea squirts. They looked at, they, they, have, they have a kind of a brain, not really a brain, but kind of a ganglion, a group of neurons holding hands that can, that can do some neat things. Like, um, you know, a, a newborn um, sea squirt has motricity. It moves through the water. It responds to light and heat and cold. And it finds an, uh, uh, the best opportunity to plant itself in a place rich with all kinds of these sort of microscopic food particles and it becomes a filter feeder. The first thing that the sea squirt does after it plants itself, knowing it's never gonna have to move again, the first thing it does is digest its own brain. Because from that point on, you don't need a brain. You just have to sit there and do the same thing over and over. And when I read that, <laughs> I saw myself sitting <laughs> in a desk at school. You plant yourself in that desk, you're a filter feeder, Right. right. You can only eat what comes to you. You don't have to go anywhere. No one asks you to do anything and you become a C squirt and you, you digest a, your own brain. You become a second um, rate computer. Yeah. And I think what we have to be is sharks. We have to move, you know, constantly. We have to learn constantly. We have to find opportunity and not wait for someone to feed us, you know, if they mm. feed you. And so that stuck with me big time. And Rodolfo Linus, if you don't know who he is, it's two L's, L-L-I-N-A-S. And he wrote a book called The Eye of the Vortex, the I, letter I of the Vortex. And I swear to you, anyone out there that's mildly interested in brains or mm. cognition or neural function or any of that stuff and kind of likes that, this is the book. I swear it's the owner's manual of the human brain. And I've read so many different brain books and so many of them really plant their little, their, their flag on one part of the brain, the neocortex, or I only study the pons area. Well, I like the hippocampus. Well, they, this is like a bigger look at the entire way our brain works. Um, I think it's it's yummy, but anyway, anyone yeah. that reads that and wants to call me up, I would love to have a, a debrief on how you felt after you read that. First 500 pages, pretty, pretty brutal, uh, good research-based stuff. And then the last hundreds of pages are just ideas about what we might do with this understanding. So mm. anyway, That's I'm a fan of that. Yeah. And Mark brought up also that the idea of fun is backed by established research. And um, and he also brings up, you know, UDL, Universal Design for Learning, which is really based on whole brain, all sense learning. So, so like. Um, we got into a, a, some some topics really quickly, and the pu whole purpose of this is like, so what's Kevin Honeycutt up to? Like, you've got a like, you've got a, a big schedule. You're traveling all over the country. Um, again, what what are you noticing about schools and uh, teachers, and what's your you know what's your goal now? Right now, I feel like we're in a bit of a triage mode, and whatever the institution or school that calls me what they say they want and then what we end up doing kind of like when you got there and said what if we just did this and they said yeah do that uh, what what the mission seems to be is to get everyone in the room 
and remind ourselves why we became educators in the first place and to remind ourselves the mission is still alive still important more important than ever kids yes they've been triggered they've been of course they've lost they've got some losses you know it kind of proves school works doesn't it but um you know i think what we want to focus on is what we can do what do we do from here mm -hmm. what do we do this positive and then one of the biggest things i'm doing is reminding us reminding us through stories and anecdote and examples and resources um, that this thing we do is still vastly important, you know, and, and I always tell teachers, you're never going to be rich, but you're always going to be wealthy. If you measure, you know, your wealth in terms of kids mm -hmm. um, and uh, they get that, they may get laughs, I get cries and that, that, that it's always a keynote you know, that's about reconfirming. It's everywhere I go right now, everywhere I go. And then there might be breakout sessions about tools and things we can do now to sort of address some of these, what we perceive as losses. Mm -hmm. And I like that your, 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 your commenter there was kind of keying on that too, is that everyone's looking at loss, loss, loss. And why do we run in and say, oh, look what we can't do. Right. <laughs> why don't we run in and say, now we're back. We're back. Okay. Let's, let's go back stronger than we were before. And then maybe change a couple of things. Cause yeah, we don't have to do it the way we were doing it before. You know, maybe it's, this is the time. What, what a friend of mine, Steve Wyckoff, Dr. Steve Wyckoff, he said, uh, never waste a good crisis. Right. And what he's saying there is people will try things in a perceived crisis that they won't try mm -hmm. in the status quo. So I don't know, I'm optimistic, but right now I'm just loving my job because, you know, if I can put some gas in the tank of a bunch of tired uh, teachers who've been through so much, you know, mm -hmm. it's been a long right. go. Um, who doesn't want that job? Who wouldn't want to be there that day and have people come up like in numbers I'd never seen before and just tell you what it meant to them to hear that, to reconfirm in themselves. I'm calling it Rebelieve right now. It's my Rebelieve tour. Um, and I know it sounds, you know, to some people that sounds soft, it sounds squishy, but I mean, if you know the job of teaching, so much of it is about faith, about, about trying, even though you can't prove or trying, even though you can't see uh, working for the thing you may never, what someone best said one time, a, a good teacher plants the seed of a tree. They'll never sit in the shade of, um, mm -hmm that's it that's this job here so yeah while i'm doing some other things and training and there's specifically some people want more technology stuff and what can we do with i love all of that macgyver stuff i love saying how can we make your chromebooks act like ferraris right you know when we that's why we build our networks we know people it's not that we're walking around with all that vast knowledge in our heads at any given time but one tweet later we can have a handful of stuff pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I'm enjoying every bit of this, whether I'm in South North Dakota or Oklahoma or um, Nebraska, Colorado, wherever I happen to be. Um, haven't done a lot of international yet. Are you getting that. a sense so, that this is also from Mark, but are you getting a sense now that now, you know, that we're coming back from the, um, from COVID uh, that it's, there's an opportunity to try some of these warmer, fuzzier, uh, friendlier varieties of interacting that because um, the, the trends uh, for the last 10 years have been, let's give them more worksheets, let's give them more homework, let's give them more um, drills. Are, are you seeing more acceptance of the friendlier, warmer things that, that actually we all know work a lot better anyhow? Right, right. Um yeah, uh, so far, uh, and people are saying, you know, we need more SEL, we need more, we need more trauma-based, we need more uh, PTSD uh, awareness, uh, and I think it, in the midst of all of that recognition that some we real... We just give a test on PTSD, right? That would cover it, right? Oh, <laughs> I, I think, I think that the sort of, uh, the myths created by all of those words, and all of those words are important, they are, but I think it's created some safe room for it to be okay, uh, to navigate from a more a human, you know, a humanistic uh, point of view, because mm -hmm. it's really hard to argue against walking slowly uh, in a minefield. Right. And we have all these triggers, and we don't even perceive how many triggers are. Even us, you and I, daily. Do you have a moment when you go, "God, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> exactly like it was before"? <laughs> I might, I might need to take this thing into the mechanic and have it looked at. Um, we've all been sort of triggered, and right. I think it's it, it's more than we know. But I don't think it's a reason to be negative. I think it's a reason to be aware and and to, to travel with a little more caution, a little more humanity, uh, the soft approaches that you're talking about. Exactly. I've always thought that was important. There was always a vein of 
educators that I know, and I'm not trying to talk anyone down here, who had kind of a buck up, you know, buck up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, these things happen. It was kind of a hardcore, I don't know. And they really had a hard time with anything that was perceived as soft. You know, maybe they had a coach that just really pounded it into them or whatever, and that worked for them. And that's the problem with all of us. We've all been to school, therefore we all think we know. Um, but things have changed a lot. This world of ours, I don't know, Mitch, do you ever feel like I'm, it's hard to keep up with all the different trends? You know, it's, it's one thing to know about them. It's another thing to live them. You know, the way people live now, the way people learn now, the way people talk to each other or date, all of it is, you know, in the last 10 years, would you agree at least it has transformed in such a way that, I mean, I almost, I want to be the person that can help explain how things have moved. Um, but at the same time, I've got to be friends with a lot of younger people <laughs> who right. actually live it. It's one yeah. thing to try to, explain. let me be the narrator in a story I've never been involved with before. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to be that guy. Um, but I do think that we've all got to kind of get our heads up out of the burrows, look around and don't look around for what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And we can always do that. Look around for what's right, what's blessed, what's kind yeah. of amazing, what's what makes me want to get up in the morning and not think the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, because we're teaching kids, and if you throw your hands up and say, Well, the end is near, and I've got people like this that I know in my family, even the end is near, it's always near, it's always next week. How easy right. is that? <laughs> I kind of want to work till the end, and when we get the yeah. memo, we'll all go, you know, it's great. Uh, but not, I don't want to give up yet. I don't know where I'm at here. I'm all over the road here, Mitch. No, no. So, 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 so what I got is that both you and I and Mark, who's, uh, who unfortunately has to leave, um, you know, are all of this mind that, Hey, you know, we, we need to be more humanistic. Okay. Um, you know, are you, um, what I, what I'm hoping is that there's enough people who say, well, you know, something, now really is the time to try a, a warm approach, social emotional learning, and not just like, okay, we got to we got to give the kids uh, we got to give the kids more homework because we got to catch them up. You know, um, you know, Finland um, actually didn't fall particularly behind, and um, and they don't give kids homework. And the the whole idea is that from the very from the very beginning, and all this is grounded into all their teachers that we are developing kids to be great human beings. And if we're developing them to be great human beings, yes, there's some academic stuff that they have, they, they have to know, but they will get that as we develop them to be great human beings. And yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's what your, a, a lot of what your message is. And that's what, um, you know, you're giving to schools and that that's, and it's very motivational for teachers because that's we we got into education because we want to turn kids and help kids become great human beings to help them become who they are we didn't get into education to be able to fill out paperwork and know that kids got a 98 on a test you know right. or they they got a four out of you know they 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 got a four they got a five I, who cares it's like are we turning out um well-adjusted human beings yeah and i like your definition of what Finland is is up to there. Um, and I think about, I always have to think about how we translate things through certain political lenses to make things uh, sustainable, especially here in our country that we we probably wouldn't say good human beings because people will take you on from every angle. Of, how do you know what a good, you know? Uh, so what I did back in the day is come up with this project-based learning approach called the life practice model. And the idea was that I want to get kids ready to have a good, happy life. Right. And so I want to give them the skills they need to build that life, to maintain that life, to evolve that life, to pivot that life, to, to be able to captain their own ship, if you will. And, and um, so that reminds me of that Finland definition. And we, if your goal is to raise well-adjusted people who can learn what they need to learn, when they need to learn and build a world that doesn't blow itself up. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you hundred percent. I think the Sometimes we work on symptoms and not the illness, right. you know, uh, we focus on measurables, which are the easiest thing. You can make them and measure them, make them and measure them all day long if you want to. Um, but are you making good kids? Are you making good people at the end of the day? And the way we measure, I think, has to change. You know, here's how I think it 
honestly right now and it's really hard to say this because i'm an old guy and i've been in this so long but a lot of my students are finding me on instagram on facebook if you want to judge me as a teacher read my interaction with kids who were in my class who were affected by me in my way of trying to build them up not get their grades up not work at the, you know if they were going to college and you want a great gpa I get you. I get you. But at the end of the day, are you happy? Do you have a family? Do you love your kids? Are you a good parent? You know, that's the stuff I want to see. And so to me, what I trust more than anything, more than any evaluation I ever had from anyone walking into my classroom is the evaluation of my former students in the way that they talk to me and the way that they reach out to me. That's the best stuff of all. Now, it's hard and to I've talk seen the comments this. of teachers that you've taught also that when you when you show up for a for a teacher day or a, or a day at a school or a day at a district um, or a day at a conference that the, that the, you know, the people who are in your audience really respond. That is the most amazing. That is the reward of all this stuff that I do. And I know that you do, uh, that you support all of these educators. And at the end of the day, what this weird side effect started occurring probably just a few years into me doing this, uh, where I would get a few people that would be in the back row and after lunch, they'd be in the front row. Hmm. And then at the end of the day, they're leaning forward and then they're coming up and talking to me. These are the friends that I meet. And this was Kimberly, by the way, our friend Kimberly um, from El Paso. She's in a room full of people and they're all great teachers. But there's this, so there's always these people I call fire peers that they, they lead up the mountain, attack the machine gun nest. They're the hmm. ones that go first and that you can't stop them. And when they're alone, you know, they, they do the best they can. And most school innovation dies of domestic violence. They're usually under assault, under attack, under suspicion. Then when you show up and you validate everything they are, everything they believe, everything they passionately defend, and they're with you. And then mm -hmm. they're your friend. I don't know. You've probably seen this. We collect people. We do. There's a uh, movement of food. Jim, and, um, and Jim Bigley just joined us. There, yay, Jim. See, that's another guy. This was right. in the audience. I met him. Um, he had this contest, and I and I I won the book about the Hunley. He knew that I was a big fan of the um, uh, the H. L. Hunley, the Civil War submarine that was on the, on the southern side. Um, and then me and him hit it off. And basically, I've watched his kids grow up. He's watched mine grow up. Uh, he's family, and it all started. I'm someplace, and I run into a guy like him, who's a go getter. He's just there's. There, you know, there's this other class of people in the world that are just hungry mm -hmm. to make a difference and you can't turn it off. So I right. think what you have to do is anoint that. And I do. I, if I ever yelled for help, I would have a, an army of people right there and I'm not going to yep. waste that. But when it's time for you and I to change the world in a big way and we've got to call our soldiers, you know, in a, to, to arms. And I don't mean in a negative way. I mean, we have to stand up for this, whether it's this movement here mm -hmm. of bringing humanity back and saying it's okay to be human and create a place where people can can learn and feel safe and feel supported and that that's as important as anything we do it is and more. And it's time right. to right get our camp together and, and yeah so we need to make sure that we have more people uh, that see the facebook live that, that you're archiving this right so yep, be here for yep. a while yeah archiving so maybe what we need to can we come back and like show it, uh, get on there one night and just be there as a panel to answer questions live after, after the fact? Um, yeah. If you Maybe. want, I know you have yeah. a life. <laughs> yeah, no, let's, you know, let's, let's set that up in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, that sounds um, great. You know, uh, sometime, uh, maybe first week in October or something. That sounds great. Okay. Yeah. The, um, the last week in September, I'm actually going to be in Finland. Uh, yeah <laughs> lucky duck i'm jealous i am i have to admit it i love finland i only flew through there on the way to norway um and did a did a, a conference there mm -hmm. but man just i was in the airport in finland which i'm like well i'm technically in finland right 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 <laughs> just yeah. not leaving the airport so yeah power to you though i love that you're out there painting on this big canvas and you know you're doing it in this sort of wise the wise father way uh, you don't tell people that they're wrong you you talk about what right looks like and then you you keep that going long enough for people to to try out some things i, I love that about you have mm. this slow patience this very patient kindness that is beautiful and i love it as an influence on oh, my seven-year-old it's been an influence on my family it's undeniable 
Um, and you can't help it. You couldn't do anything else. <laughs> that's who you are. <laughs> but that's why we're talking right, right now. I just love you, man. And uh, well, thank you. Wow. Thanks. Yeah, can't help it, buddy. I love you. <laughs> Good people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's 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 set up a Q and A um, with you know give people a chance once they've seen the video. Uh, we'll set up a Q and A for the first week in October. Then um, sounds great. Uh, my guess is I'm best off setting that up with Michelle because she's the one who's organized. <laughs> yes. she okay, is. Yeah. there's a lot of things that I really love about you, but your sense of organization is a little bit um, lacking. And the difference between uh youth and wisdom is that i know that <laughs> I, used to would, I used to would argue but i've been married 31 years i know yeah. what i'm good at and i know what i need help with and no you're such that. a passionate inspiring individual so yeah back at you okay back at okay. you my friend okay all right so yeah thanks. all right well thank you um thanks everybody for watching and um you know we'll we'll be back on in a, in a few weeks see ya Bye.